The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. Today, we're going to be having a projector showdown, new versus old and different technologies. Before we get started, I just wanted to talk for a little bit, sorry for anyone that that upset, about um, the history of projectors. Now, obviously you start with film projectors sort of way back when, and they don't have to have any electronics in them, they can be purely mechanical. But I just wanted to spare a moment to think something I didn't really appreciate until very recently. When you're feeding the film past a projector, you can't just have the shutter open and close on the film. That shutter's got to open and close while the film's stationary. So the film doesn't actually go past the lens at a constant rate. It's actually moving into position, shutter opening, shutter closing. Mechanically, that's that's a challenge. That's really tough to do. And it's just something that I thought was really cool about old projectors. Anyway, fast forward a very long time. And uh, the first projectors are this type with three lenses, red, green, and blue, and they project a light. Now, I, in preparing for this video, I actually did some research to find out what technology that was, what they used, because that, um, in my memory, was the oldest kind of projector that I knew. And I was really stunned to find out that's a CRT projector. Each one of those red, green, and blue tubes is a CRT, and they had to be individual because you couldn't get the brightness required for projecting an image out of um, a, a colour um, CRT. And my memory of them is public spaces, normally a bar or a pub or somewhere like that where they've got something like football or sports on. And it was always a slightly old projector where one of the colours was misaligned. So you ended up with a really weird screwy image that was kind of two colours worked and then like the green was offset slightly. Just one of the traits of uh, having to combine colours separately. Bear that in mind, because we're going to come back to it. The next type of projector I remember, and this is a real sort of mid-90s thing, which I couldn't even find when I started researching. Hopefully by the time I come to edit this, I'll have found a picture here. When I was at school, we had a laptop that we knew was called a Cyclone laptop. Now this laptop worked like any other. It was a little bit thicker and a little bit heavier, but that was kind of a necessary evil for what you could do with it. Because this, this laptop, you could pop the LCD off of the backlight now, the bezel. It had a little extension lead that was just about a foot long, about 30 centimeters, but you could put the blank LCD on an overhead projector. Now I'm probably showing my age here when I was thinking that was amazing and it was the best technology I'd ever seen. So essentially it was kind of an external LED and separate LCD LCD projector. Now that was kind of a requirement because of the size limitations of an LCD screen and the pixel density. To get any sort of decent image out of an LCD, it had to be big. Fast forward a few years, pixel density goes up and you end up with one of these, an LCD projector. So we may as well go chronological and start with that. Now the first comparison I want to make, and I don't want to get too much into what the technical differences are right now, this LCD projector is probably about half the footprint of this DLP projector. And it's not only half the footprint, but it's probably two thirds of the height as well. In comparison, LCD projectors are enormous comp compared to their modern equivalents. Before we go any further, if you want to have a guess in the comments, tell us why you think that might be, do it now. Well, first on some electronics, we'll have to look up what that is. Rounding screw, let's call it for now. It's gonna come out. That's such a weird accessory. I was absolutely expecting there to be a, a, a board edge connector uh, or some data interface to signify that this was used to interface with something on board the projector, but it's absolutely not. The only connections were a ground connection and a power connection. So this must have just been a projector with a built-in Ethernet switch for 
local work group sharing. But yeah, without any ability to connect the rest of the projector to the network, it just seems like a really odd choice. And of course, the obligatory dust filter, which will be full of years of someone else's dust. Nice little centrifugal fan design. I'm guessing this is the lamp cover, which looks like it's already missing some screws. It's probably the lamp that went. The lamp, the lamp in old models like this is worth more than pretty much the rest of the projectors together. So if your lamp goes or it has very few hours left, the value of the projector falls to pretty much nothing. So something like this lamp module, there we go. This lamp module is probably worth more than the rest of the projector together, assuming this still worked. And I actually don't know if it did, but for the value that I bought the whole projector for, probably didn't. But this is, as far as I can work out, a high intensity discharge type light lamp. So the top half of the case was just retained by some speaker connectors. Got lots of connections onto this board. And this is where most of the image processing and LCD control will be. I've got to say, this is one of the nicest labelled boards I think I've worked with so far. You just see down here, you can see next to each plug, there is in the silk screen a little label. SE, SM, SA, SF. And each of the connectors has got a little label printed on it. That's so nice to see. Yeah. Lots of ribbons. Now, here is the first thing that's going to start to tell you how this may work. Across here, we've got three identical ribbons going down, each at 90 degrees offset to each other. That, I think, is going to be very important when we get inside it a little further. And on board, we've got what appears to be a main CPU, which is Mitsubishi branded chip and four identical, this is probably memory for video RAM, because as far as I know, this actually has to do some video processing uh, and do a little bit of buffering. So that's what the RAM chips will be for. Oh, even more RAM on this side. Got Sony video processing, bespoke CPU. Yeah, this is, this is a nice expensive board. <laughs> I think the, the lamps are, mains voltage so i don't really see the need for a large power supply unless uh, all of the electronics are actually using a fair amount as well um and in which case i expect to find a big transformer whether that's switch my power supply or a physical transformer i don't know yet oh, of course the type of lamp doesn't actually run off of mains voltage it's high intensity discharge lamp it needs control gear which is why you end up with high temperature leads or ht leads or, or high voltage leads so yeah of course it's not mains voltage of course that's why you need a big power supply you've got control gear for the lamp in there this thing must have taken so long to assemble when it was put together because there are dozens of screws in this and they are all in fiddly places it's just kind of adding to that air of this was, when it was built, a very high quality piece of equipment. Yes. There we go, right. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me because I'm going to nerd out for a moment here. This is the inside of an LCD projector. What you have here are three monochrome LCD screens and they don't have a backlight of course because they have the main lamp which sits roughly over here shining light this way now the light out of there gets processed by a handful of lenses now basically the job of this and this are to collimate the light and I think this tells a very good story as to why this projector was sold for parts because I don't know how best to show this to you. That has got all the hallmarks of liquid spillage and droppage, or actually that could easily be thermal shock. So this would have been originally one piece. And I suspect at some point, some liquid was spilt on it and it cooled too fast and split as well as the liquid residue on there, which has sort of cooked on because it was probably very hot when it did it. 
which is why all of these optics need to be air cooled at all times. So as well as that, we've got a pair of lenses which look like this, which are compound lenses to try and focus and collimate that light as straight as possible. So as much of the light from the lamp makes it through the optics as possible. Now you can obviously tell from the size of this versus the size of an LCD, which I can't get out yet, I will in a minute. A lot of light gets wasted and of course in here that just goes to heat. Then you've got some of these wonderful big lenses. Such precision grinding. <laughs> and the quality of the mirrors as well. These are normal silvered mirrors, but they will be optically incredibly high precision. Right, then we get to the cool bit. Now this is a color selective mirror. So from one side, it looks like a colored reflection, but from the other side, it looks like a different colored reflection. So what that actually does is only let certain frequencies of light through. And that splits off one color light by only allowing it through. So only the, I'm not sure which one's which, but let's say only the red light is allowed through that mirror. So only the red light passes through this LCD. The green and the blue light is reflected this way. And then you have another color separating mirror, which reflects green, but lets blue through. So the green then goes through this LCD and this lens, whereas the blue light continues round into here. This prism, this giant block of glass right here is recombining those three images and they all get projected out the front. <laughs> that, that as a process I, I always find is so cool. So white light starts over here, goes through the optics and is collimated, goes through here, red light passes straight through here to this LCD, green and blue are reflected, blue is reflected here, goes straight through, and then green passes straight through again, bounce back through this LCD. And then the LCDs are just black and white producing the contrast for each pixel, which then reassembles that image in a prism and sends it down the optic lens. It's amazing that this is even possible without these three LCDs getting out of position, out of color, the fact that we can engineer lenses which can reject or reflect specific wavelengths of light. And I, I love this layout, this labyrinth of lenses and mirrors and color filters. It's amazing. LCD out of the way, let's get on with the DLP. Thankfully, this is far less of a workout to pick up every time. Hopefully, it'll be a lot easier to get into too, because that was definitely a challenge. So let's start with the obvious and get the lamp cover off. Unbelievable. No wonder this was cheap. Somebody's had the lamp out of it. <laughs> well, all I can say is that I will have to look up the unit. I think this would have been a 200 watt high intensity discharge lamp as opposed to the 300 we had in the last unit. Right, now this one has got a definite manufacture date of 2005 in it. So this was, in terms of cheap and commercially available projectors, kind of early, uh, 2005 for a DLP projector. This must have been probably quite expensive still. Wow. That is a lot more compact than the last one. You want to know a secret? I have taken an LCD projector apart once before. Uh, and actually that is why my old multimeter has got some burn marks and notches missing out of it. It's a story for another time perhaps. But uh, I've never taken a DLP projector apart. And when I finally learned how DLP projectors worked, knowing how an LCD worked, I think I was just amazed that it was even physically possible to do the things that happen in here. So you power, your video control board, and then this assembly. Now you compare that to just the output optics of the LCD display, 
and obviously you've got the prism and the LCDs that would have been there, but you haven't got the labyrinth and the, the um, optical splitting of refining the light before it can go through the LCDs. So the size of the DLP projector is so much smaller than an LCD. This chip on the back here is the DLP chip, digital light processing. Now this tiny little rectangle in the middle here is made up of thousands of microscopic mirrors. And each one of those mirrors has got the ability to be electronically actuated so it moves just a few degrees in pitch. Now that pitch is enough to make the difference between reflecting the light from an internal black surface to absorb the light or through the output optics. But they're so small and so close to being massless, don't, sorry physicists, so easy to move in an efficient and fast way that they can move in thousands of times a second to the extent that they can do something akin to uh, pulse width modulation of the light, which is what gives us our levels of grey. Now, for me, the fact that there are that many mirrors on this thing, because I cannot make out anything other than just a single shiny mirror on that. It doesn't look to me like there are tiny parts or anything. The fact that there are that many mirrors and they are each uniquely controllable absolutely blows my mind. And then we get onto the speed because you may have worked out already that that only produces a grayscale image. That's where we get onto the next bit. So it produces an image four times over one for each colour let through by this spinning wheel and then you have a white section which just adds to the brightness of the overall image so if there are whites it will all come through and be topped up by the um, by the whatever the opposite monochromatic light is and this wheel spins incredibly fast to produce your 25 frame per second image but then you've got to think that the mirrors on there are potentially producing 255 levels of grey four times a second for each of the different colours and the white light as well. So those mirrors are going so fast. The difference in technology to make this work over three LCDs on a and a prism and colour splitting light, it's just incredible. My mind absolutely is blown by that being physically achievable and possible. And then to say this is DLP, this is how most modern projectors work, at least until you get up to lasers and LED uh, based projectors, that's a topic for a whole other video. This is amazing, the, the, the miniaturization, the, the research, the technology, the precision of assembly and manufacturing that went into both of these methods of creating light. This electronically for the timing of the colour wheel rotation and this for the precision of alignment of those three screens in a prism. They are absolutely incredible. I think it's pretty clear that I find this stuff absolutely fascinating and thank you for coming along for the ride. If you've got a suggestion for a good teardown that you'd like to see, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Let me know what you'd like to see. But thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.